we're going to introduce you to the world of shared practices. Welcome to the Shared Practices podcast. If you already know who we are, great. Ironically, so much changes that you might not realize everything that's happened in the last months, years. We want to take you through the journey that we've been through so that you know, are these guys worth listening to for me? I'm Dr. Richard Lowe. I founded this podcast 2016 as a young army dentist who had no clue how to run a dental practice, buy a dental practice. I wanted to create the resource that I didn't have at the time to help other people figure out, hey, is practice ownership worth it for me? And then if so, how do I start or buy a dental practice and then actually run it? And somewhere along the line, we brought on Dr. George Hariri. Welcome, George. Thanks, man. The funny thing is about our show is that people listen to it in season chronology. Like sometimes somebody will reach out to me and say, hey, I'm on season two. Well, we're on season six. So (laughs) season two, episode nine, you were introduced to a third year dental student. That's me. And I joined Richard at Shared Practices as his partner. And, you know, at the time I was just a dental student obsessed with practice management. And now I'm a dentist obsessed with practice management. Not much has changed, but at the same time, everything has changed. Should we tell them a little bit more of that story, bringing you on? We should. At that point, I was a season into this podcast, really loved it. But I was also a resident in the Army's two-year AEGD program they have at Fort Hood. And there was a lot of time constraints. I was a young father, two young kids. Marriage was kind of on the rocks because I had overcommitted myself and said, hey, hon, I know that I'm super busy at this residency and I'm gone all the time, but when I come home, I'm going to disappear into the closet and record audio with strangers on the internet. Um, <laughs> and that, for, for whatever reason, that didn't fly well. Um, and, and she came around to, to the point where she was like, you know what? This isn't working. You've got family, podcast, and residency. Choose two. She brought my suitcase, packed it, put it in the trunk of my car during lecture and in residency, and then texted me like, hey, go find a hotel room, figure out your priorities and get caught up on residency crap. And I don't want you to come home and be stressed. I don't want to feel guilty for demanding your time and attention. In retrospect, it was the appropriate thing for her to do. Stuff was out of balance. So I had some friends that I was in communication with. Uh, George was one of them. I had met him online via uh some dental town uh, acquaintances back in the day. And I let them know like, guys, I might have to kill this podcast. I want to stay married. I might drop out of residency. I think this is, this podcast has a potential to be life-changing for me and for others. And uh, George, you stepped up to the plate. What what was your perspective on this? Yeah. So I was, I had a two month old baby and I spent my whole third year of dental school. I was one of the top producing D3s in clinic. And I did that to get days off. And Mm. I used all of those days off Uh, after my son was born. So I was sitting at home with a six-week-old baby bored out of my mind and because he sleeps all day. Like, you know, (laughs) I was there to take care of him. And and then Richard was like, well, I need some help with this podcast. And I was like, well, yes, let's do this. And I was also, you know, I had obsessed with practice management all throughout dental school. And I was starting to really look for something to put that energy into. We call it angst. Right, you you had the angst. That's why you started the show, and I had the angst, and I wanted to invest in something and have somewhere to put that energy. And so, yeah, I mean, I I thought it. Yeah, I did not think I wanted to be on air. I wanted to be the guy behind the scenes. I did not want to be on the mic. And uh, I've I've come to love podcasting and talking. It's my favorite part of it. And you know, now we have a second show called Dental Friends with Benefits that I enjoy doing as well. Yeah, you you really have done a one eighty on your. Uh... I mean, you still don't listen to podcasts, but you're now a phenomenal podcaster. So uh, you, you get caught there. So uh, we should probably introduce Matt somewhere in here. I, I yeah, know so what... I, I'm I'm getting there. So let me go ahead and take it from here. And so you know okay. we we so anyway you know this was March that was May of 17. So May of 2017 I came on, and for about two years it was Richard and I, and we were just trying to grow the podcast and we kind of did some online course stuff that we did with our audience, but we didn't really like do anything super, we, our life, you know, our course was great. It was life-changing to to those who took it and followed it, but it wasn't until we had met Matt and Matt was one of many of our listeners who listened to everything we had said, followed the recipe we put out there, bought a practice and was doing incredibly well for himself financially. And he was taking a life coaching program and he wanted to give back to Dennis by coaching and helping them do the things that he did that we helped him do. And so he reached out to us to join our company and that's when we brought on our third partner, uh, our COO today, Macarino. Wow. Thanks for that, guys. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Macarino. Um, 
So I, I am a listener from the start. Like Richard and George's words were pretty much gospel in my life. <laughs> and I did, I followed the exact <laughs> recipe to get into practice ownership and once in there to succeed and kind of owe everything I have to them. Um, so it was, you know, the thrill of a lifetime to be able to come on as a partner and, and help build, you know, the offerings we have today with coaching and mastermind and um, truly impact uh, a lot of young dentists lives. Um, and, you know, we're crazy excited about everything we're building here. So thrilled to be here, thrilled to be talking to some, some new people, maybe don't know about us, which is really exciting. Uh, we have a really core group of loyal listeners. So being exposed to other dentists is always something we, we look forward to and welcome. So thank you. Awesome. And so are we going to introduce the last host on this, on this recording? Yeah, I think we should. I think, I think we Matt, can do. Like, can we go ahead and do an introduction for our fourth guest? Yeah, you got it. Matt. Okay. So our fourth <laughs> guest, I thought you were taking, I'll take it. Um, we have our director of pre-owner mastermind and our host of our Wednesday show, The Pursuit of Ownership, current dental student, Tyler Tilbert. Hey, Matt, thanks for bringing me in uh, reluctantly. Um, I uh, kind of got skipped over in the chronology of things there. Yeah, but, I got to uh, I gotta go back. It, it, that, <laughs> Matt, that introduction for Tyler did not do any, like there's like 10% justice. No service to me right, you got it. So That's why I said you got it. So actually, Tyler came on before Matt. It, on air, Matt came on first, but it was in my D4 year. I was starting to be on the podcast. I'd been on the podcast for about six months. And I was helping people do evals all the time. And by evals, it means somebody's looking to buy a practice and they need some help looking at the practice's financials. Is this a good practice for me? Something we talk about a lot on our show. And I was getting requests a lot from listeners and it was starting to get overwhelming and I needed some help. And Ty Dalla, as he says in his description, Tyler, uh, reached out to me and he wanted to be a part of – he just – I don't even know why he reached out to me. I, I think he had responded to like an auto email that went out. And I remember reading the email and being super impressed with him as a first year dental student. And so I said, you know, I'm a fourth year dental student. I clearly have a lot of experience to teach you. So, you know, come under my wing and uh, let me mentor you for the next three years while you're in dental school. And he had just started dental school. And so I reached out to Tyler and then, you know, a lot of roles in between then and now, you know, now he leads our Wednesday segment. So we have a Monday segment of our show, which is Richard's segment. And that's what started the whole thing. That was the season's chronologies. We have seasons one, two, three, four, five, six. And Richard will talk about that in a second. And then Matt and I run a segment called Practice Underwater, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then Tyler runs our Wednesday segment, which is the pursuit of ownership. So Tyler, welcome to the show. Take it away. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. So um, yeah, it, it's funny hearing Matt talk about listening to yours and, uh, and Richard's words as gospel. I, I think I was definitely under the spell as well, uh, despite the fact that, you know, you'd only been in for about six months and, you know, we're just a D4 yourself. Uh, you know, somehow I, I just got totally hypnotized by that and I was willing to do a whole lot of stuff for free. So um, <laughs> <laughs> for, <laughs> been doing that for quite some time. Um, but yeah, no, it, it was funny, you know, being a D1, uh, going through helping, you know, dentists evaluate practices and make decisions on, you know, what practice they were going to buy into. And I mean, you know, we, we've seen how that's been such a life-changing thing for people. Um, it's been a real honor for me and I've certainly learned a lot. And uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot between uh, then and now, but I'm super happy to uh, have taken up the mantle of, you know, the dental student teaching dentists how to purchase practices. And uh, um, I'm really <laughs> proud and happy to do it. Uh, I have a co-host of my segment as well, uh, Peyton Keller, who's kind of being groomed as my successor. Um, and we're both uh, kind of the last remaining dental students in this tribe here. But uh, yeah, it's it's a great team to be a part of. So I'm happy to be here. That's awesome. Can I um, give the overarching Please. hypothesis for shared practices? Um, so, so we talked about angst um, driving a lot of our personal motivation to learn practice management, to learn how to be good practice owners, to learn how to buy the right dental practice. But I think for a lot of people, a common starting point for that angst is student loans. Um, and, and, and whether or not that endpoint kind of matters, at the very beginning, you're in dental school, you're looking at 400, 500. NYU students are now looking at over $700,000 of student loans, um, all in cost, which is the funniest thing. NYU has taken down the full estimates with like the cost of living stuff. I think they're embarrassed by it on their website. Like you don't you don't get the full breakdown on the website. You have to actually sign up and go to NYU to then get the sticker shock of the 700K. Um, you got to collect the secondary application fee first. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and so this like angst of, holy crap, this is a lot of debt. 
am I ever going to get out of this? Is practice ownership even on the table for me? Is it worth it? Corporates coming in and telling us that like, hey, you can't own a dental practice because you have too much debt. It's too competitive. Practice ownership is dead. That's just like not what you do in dentistry anymore. I think that's a very common starting point for this angst from a lot of us um, and, and really puts a very fine point on how serious people are taking practice ownership because it's like getting out from under that debt as an associate can be really hard to do, especially when those numbers get higher, the interest levels get higher. Whereas ownership, the hypothesis of our show is that ownership is the tool and the vehicle um, for financial independence and success, paying down those student loans, living the lifestyle that you want to live. And whether or not you even choose to pay down those student loans, once you've got that income and, and control over your life and your financial future is a whole different issue. But we have consistently been trying to answer the question, okay, is practice ownership right for me? That was season one. How do I prepare for it? And then if it is, how do I not screw it up? Because there is some ways to royally screw this up. You can buy the wrong practice. You can do a crappy startup. And so like practice ownership, like at the same time that we definitely think it's the answer for, for the right group of people, it's also not this like automatic get out of jail free card. You have to do it right. You have to get into it the right way. And then you have to be a business owner and a leader in a practice. And there's so many ways to just kind of get buried by that. And so now that we've had people that have bought practices because of our podcast, who've started practices kind of all along the way with us, we have this obligation, we feel like, to continue to help these people succeed. Um, and so what started off as a podcast of like, hey, let's interview people who are in the middle of this journey. We're going on this journey together. Um, all of us other than Tyler now have had uh, a wide variety of ownership experiences. Um, and we now have solutions to all of these problems all along the way um, and results. And so I, I've got a friend who he was a, a roommate of mine freshman year of undergrad. And before either of us knew we were going into dentistry, he ended up uh, listening to our podcast uh, as it was kind of coming out, took us on our word and bought a dental practice. And he texted me after his first year of ownership. And he said, I paid more in taxes last year than I made as an associate the previous year. Um, so if you're paying that much taxes, you're making a whole lot of money. That's um, awesome. He then texted me uh, just recently. He said, I am now officially a millionaire um, because of what you guys have done at Shared Practices. And so he is, is making big moves and, and he bought a, a healthy bread and butter practice. He's not doing anything crazy, um, but he, he bought the right practice and he's done really well with it. So that's the prototype of, hey, this is possible. And uh, if you want help at any point along this journey, we want to be here for you, whether that's free help via the podcast and our Facebook group, or the, that's more customized um, handholding, helpfulness, community, mastermind, coaching, all of the above. We now have the ability to help people at any point in their journey. And a lot of that has been George, Matt and Tyler building all of this while I'm still in the army. I'm not out of the army for another Four months or three months, I think now. Uh, <laughs> April 7th, 2021. I started this podcast knowing I had five more years in the army. And I, I, by the end of it, I was like, hey, if I'm if no one's listening and we haven't gotten any traction, we'll just shut it down at that point and I'll move on. So Richard, uh, you touched on two things. So you said, if no I, one's listening, uh, what, what happened to the podcast over the last four and a half years? I, I think because we said, hey, we're going to help young dentists and ignore all of the older dentists who already have a practice and think they know exactly how to run a practice. Um, we've, we've been incredibly blessed to help people and the reviews and the growth have reflected that. So we've got um, well over 400 five-star reviews in iTunes, which makes us the number one rated dental podcast in iTunes out of over 70, 80 plus dental podcasts. We've had 1.2 million downloads um, and we've got an amazing community of people on Facebook that are practice ownership oriented, positive, supported, supportive. Um, you know, our, our Facebook group has never really turned into a dumpster fire, like in, in all our years of having a Facebook group, which is pretty incredible. Um, so we, we've had growth and we've had uh, amazing people tune in and contribute and share their experiences and support other people. And it's been incredible to see. 
So I want to add one thing to what Richard had said. He talked about his college friend, and I, I won't say his name, but I know exactly who you're talking about, obviously. And you know that you might listen to that and say, like, "Wow, they're showing their best. Like that's like their superstar." We want that to be average. That's average in our world. And so our slogan, redefining average, means we're taking what you might think is like an amazing result, and we're making it ordinary. And everyone in our ecosystem is that's what we expect, and that's what, that's what they get. And that's why we feel like we're we're doing something special in this industry because we're taking results that people have called ridiculous, unheard of, whatever, and we're making them ordinary. You know. And if you look at Richard, I'm going to talk about you for a minute, and then I'll talk about Matt, and then I'll talk about me. If you look at what right. Richard has accomplished in the military, so Richard, multiple practice owner in the military, you know, Richard, how many did you buy in the military? So I have bought three with partners who did the majority of the work, but it felt very impossible at the time to buy even one while I was still in the army. I, I fully did not expect to buy three dental practices with still two years left on my army commitment. So we have a multi-practice owner in the military starting a podcast with over a million downloads in over a hundred countries. That's a one of a that's a one in a how many military dentists have ever existed person that we have in Richard Lowe. And then you have Matt Garino who listens to what we did and bought a practice in New York. And we have a term on our show. It's called Macarino Money. And I won't tell you how much it is, but we talk about it on the show. And it it signifies that as a solo dentist in Matt's practice in New York, he accomplished an income level that so we talked about how much Todd paid taxes. Owner dentists make less than it wasn't Todd, taxes. Right. I have multiple freshman oh. roommates that oh. ended up becoming dentists and have followed our advice. Oh, I, I paid three <laughs> over three times what I made as an associate in taxes. Yeah. So and Matt there. worked as an associate and then paid over three times that in taxes as a solo dentist. We call that making Mac Garino money. You know, the percentile of that before he turned 30, you know, that's super rare. And for myself, you know, I graduated dental school and I bought a practice doing over a million dollars, which as a new grad, to buy a practice of that size is, you know, very rare. And then to have grown it two and a half times in two years is also very rare. And so you have three people that have done the thing that we talk about doing all the time to a level that is above what we even consider average. And so average in our world is superb everywhere else, but in our world it's average. And I want to, you know, we're not people that are just saying stuff. We're people that are doing it too. Well, Tyler, I want to hear your perspective on this. Um, the funny thing is, is that because we can surround ourselves with people like this, sometimes we forget that like m most of people in dental school, like just aren't even thinking about this kind of stuff. Do you, and you live in these two different worlds. You live in this world of like us always talking, thinking, having so many perspectives, so much data that we can use to make these decisions and learn from our, our people. And then you flip over and you talk with some of your classmates who just like haven't really thought about practice ownership yet at all. What's that like? I lead a vicarious life, Richard. Um, <laughs> you know, I still exist in that, uh, in that ecosystem that, um, you know, represents a lot of dogma um, that I think we kind of unravel on the show. Um, and so it can be difficult sometimes, you know, maintaining uh, both worlds simultaneously. Um, and I can't wait for my story to emerge uh, as I get out of school and and have my own thing to talk about. But, um, you know, it is difficult uh, at times, but at the same time, it, it, it creates that contrast. And it, it reminds me of just how fortunate I am to to be among you guys and and to be working with you and to be working towards the cause of, that we are. Um, you know, I, I think one thing you were touching on when you were introducing the show, and, and, and I'm sure the audience is picking up as well, is that a lot of these stories are emerging from very young people. And, um, you know, I think one really important uh, myth that we've kind of broken down is that, you know, you need to have a certain number, you know, of years of experience as an associate, just learning things by diffusion in order to be ready uh, for ownership. We hear that all the time. People just don't think they're ready. Um, and I think we've really done a lot of work to kind of diffuse that and, and show that it's, it's not you know, it's not just a, a certain amount of time that, uh, you know, like like you're cooking something that <laughs> someone just gets ready uh, to be an owner. It's it's a decision and it's a lifestyle. It's intentionality. And, um, you know, that's what we're all about. And, you know, we welcome that at any stage of someone's career. If they come at us um, and right before they're starting dental school or D1, they say, hey, I, I'm really intent on practice ownership. And, and we say, OK, well, we're starting now. 
uh, and and people decide to be pre owners, you know, as soon as they're ready. Um, and uh, I, I think that's something that's really transformative about the show. And you know, we have, uh, you know, we're working on developing pathways for just about any listener. So. I want to expand on that because, you know, obviously we're a bunch of young guys and, you know, you think of like a a dentist who's older looking at us as these kids, you know, I'm 27, Matt's 31, Richard, are you 33? 34. 34 now, you know, you know, our, our senior member is uh, a prime 34 years old (laughs) and, you know, he very much is the father of the group, making sure the rest (laughs) of us behave and we don't, but, you know, nonetheless, you know, I think it's, it's symbolic of our audience. Our audience is 2015 grads and younger. And it's not because that's not, we don't want anyone else. It's just, those are the people that they look at us as peers and they say, wow, if they could do it at my age, then I can do it too. And, you know, at this point, we've now identified that we have dental students listening. We have associate dentists listening and we have owner dentists listening. And so our evolution from guys with a podcast to, uh, you know, a company that can help these people is that we now are able to offer solutions for every single segment of our audience. You know, whether you're a dental student, an associate dentist, or an owner dentist, we all have the same goal. And that's to make the most out of our lives through practice ownership. And we have a way for each of those people to go along that path with us. And that's something I'm really proud of is that we've we've gone from just waiting for them to become owners to help them to helping them wherever they are at whatever price point they can afford. And while you're talking there, I thought of a, a metaphor that I think perfectly describes our audience. So if you all have seen the movie Social Network, there's a scene where Eduardo Saverin, who's the co-founder of Facebook, he goes in to sign some papers for some like restructuring of the company. And the lawyer is going through like technical terms and he like he knows all of it. And the guy says, that's why I love working with business owners. And I thought about like now that we've coached dozens of dentists, help run their practices in our, in our coaching department, we know when one when that client is a share practice listener yeah. because of how advanced they are they they already know all the, all the terms that it's so much easier to get through them and work on higher level things than if someone comes to us and, and just hasn't consumed any of our content so i want to take a minute and go through if you've never listened to our podcast and it's overwhelming there's over 300 episodes is it 300 episodes richard yeah yeah we brought 300 yeah. over 300 episodes which they're hour long each like this is a lot of content i don't care how much you two exit it's going to take a while And so, you know, let's go through every season and everything we have, and then you can pick, you know, it's, it's great because wherever you're at in your life, whatever's relevant to your journey is where you should start. If you're already a practice owner, seasons one, two, and three might not appeal to you. If you don't want to work on case acceptance then maybe not season four. So Richard, can you go through the different seasons that we've had on our show and a little synopsis of each one so that someone listening for the first time would know where to start? I'd love to. So season one, uh, I mentioned earlier the biggest question is, you know, we've we've been pumping up practice ownership, showing the financial results of it. But there's a lot of ways to be a dentist. You can be a military dentist. You can be a, in academia. You can have a successful career working for someone else. And knowing whether or not you want to be a practice owner is is a pivotal step. And I didn't want to just assume, hey, everyone wants to be a practice owner. This is right for everyone. So there's a portion of season one that's dedicated to, is practice ownership right for me? And then if so, is it worth it? And I think we've shown pretty well, if you are into it, then yes, it is worth it. But some of the questions you can ask yourself to know, is it right for me? Number one, you have to have a risk tolerance. You have to be willing to take on additional debt. Um, Being a practice owner, you're providing not only your income, but also your team. Things like COVID definitely happen. And, you know, that's a pretty extreme case, but we made it through. But stuff's going to happen in the future. Risks have to be taken in practice ownership. So your ability to deal with risk um, and additional debt, your willingness to manage people. I think that's a big one for a lot of people is they, uh, dentists who get into practice ownership and aren't prepared to manage people and don't have the tools to get coaching and to become a better leader and a manager. um, Those are the ones who are the most miserable. So knowing, am I willing to manage people and am I willing to get the training and support to, to, do that if you're not naturally good at that. You can get better at that um, is, is another part of it. And then lastly, uh, are you willing to learn the business side of things? So you can't stick your head in the sand and just assume my practice is going to run itself. If I just have good systems, I don't have to be a good business owner. Um, and, and being a business owner uh, is, is its own skill set that is not taught in dental school at all. So you have to have those three components. And then there's some other stuff like, what are your goals? What's your timeline? Um, you know, 
what career pivots do you know you're going to take? What's what's your spouse's situation if you're married or, or, or things like that? So there's a lot of reasons why someone wouldn't be a practice owner. And if you can't answer yes to those questions of risk, of managing people and learning the business side, then even though it might financially be worth it, then it's probably not a good fit for you. But I, I think that conversation, like respecting all the other ways that you can be a dentist and also some self-introspection needs to happen first. So then once you've cleared that hurdle, then how do I prepare for ownership? So liquidity, cash on hand is going to be essential for an acquisition or a startup either way. So rather than paying down loans, sock some cash into a bank account. It doesn't have to need, need to be like any sort of investment, just you need cash on hand and you need to figure out what kind of practice you want to buy. That's the two most important things is getting ready financially and knowing what you want. And I think we've learned since season one, the thing that we didn't do well in season one is answering that question of what kind of practice do I want? Um, because we, we kind of had to try out some of these different models and realize the pros and cons and who they're suited for. Um, and I think the default that most dentists fall into um, is a solo practice owner. So a dentist who is in the practice, there's no other dentist, you are producing, you're the business owner, a smaller team. That is a, a very straightforward way, if you buy the right practice, to make good money, possibly Matt Greeno type money um, as a solo practice owner without having to multiply the headaches of business ownership and of managing people. Um, and if you're the type of person that says, I want to do dentistry until the day I die, that's probably the type of practice that you should be in. If you're a person who really, really likes the business side of things, then maybe, uh, and you're also thinking maybe there's a point where I'm like barely a clinical dentist. I'm there a day or two a week. And then there's a practice that runs itself. Maybe a, a larger single group practice um, would be a good model for us. So George, I'll let you defer to you on how uh, you help people make that decision and recognize in themselves uh, what kind of model they should think about. So one thing you'll learn as you listen to our show, and I love that Richard is going through our whole journey. And if some of it's don't apply to you, you know, just kind of hang with us. But, you know, we missed this early on. Therefore, I missed this early on, right? I did not realize my vision was not to practice clinical dentistry. It took me doing it to find that out. And so if we could go back and amend season one, which is, is ownership right for me, and season two, which is buying a practice, the thing that we really missed is vision. And I, I was a dental student and I didn't realize how much I was super passionate about clinical, the, the dental practice management more than the actual doing of the dentistry itself. And so I walked into a practice intending to be a solo doctor like Richard had described because I knew that was the way to make the most predictable income. And after doing it, I realized I hated it. And I ended up pivoting my practice. I have two full-time associates now. And I go in starting this year, the beginning of 2021, I'm in every other week for just a couple hours managing the practice. And then I leave and I do this, which is my passion. And so you know, I think the thing that I'd add is to listen to yourself. And that's one thing that the show will teach you is how to listen to yourself and how to understand what you want and how to use that to then find the right practice, which is really season two. So the only thing I'll add is a little warning for our audience. You know, I want to put this in, probably should have come in earlier. If you read our iTunes reviews, you'll see this show will change your life. And you might not want a life-changing event, but you will get one if you keep listening. And my life has changed. Richard's life has changed. Matt's life has changed, Tyler's life has changed, and everyone on our team's lives have changed because of shared practice, and everyone in our audience's life has changed because of shared practices. It's, it's, really, it's really that impactful. I will also say practice ownership is kind of like being a parent where you're never going to be ready. You just got to jump in. And sometimes you get it wrong the first time. I think all of us here uh, who are practice owners, sorry, Tyler, um, have have jumped into practice ownership thinking we knew what model of practice ownership we wanted. For me, I said in the in my fourth year of dental school, hey, I would love to own multiple practices and be the traveling specialist between those offices. And I have since realized being in that role that I don't love scaling and having multiple offices um, and that I would I would rather work closely with a, a smaller team or or um, have more one-on-one -on -one relationships with my team members. And I'm, I'm exploring other models. I'm, I'm looking at a different model of dentistry than what I went into initially. And same thing with George. And now same thing with Matt as well. So it, you don't have to have this perfectly figured out, 
but at least you should know what the menu is and the pros and the cons and which one you think you're gravitating to. And I don't think we did a good job of that. So I think that's something that we've covered in season six on growth. Um, we've covered that in, in exploring different models um, and then in, in practice underwater um, a lot better. So anything to add to that before we move on from season one, which is, is taken a long time now, but it's been really good. Yeah, I think we should just rush, not rush through, but kind of give a quick synopsis of the seasons. Okay. So, you know, so you had go want to start with season two then? Yeah. So season two was, okay, I want to be a practice owner. How do I actually find value and buy a dental practice? Um, a lot of people think I can't find a practice. They just try and look on the broker's website. They assume they can't find one. They give up. And so they do a startup because they couldn't find the right practice. And there's lots of practice mailers, other ways of finding off-market deals. Um, valuing a practice, once you found it, how do I know if this practice is good or a lemon? That's huge. We did deep dives that are way too deep for a podcast, but we wanted to get the information all out there on practice valuation. Um, and then Tyler and Peyton have done that since um, on uh, practice underwater. So, or, or sorry, uh, on TPO, the, the pursuit of ownership. So talk to us about kind of how much acquisition focused is that Wednesday segment that we now have on the pursuit of ownership? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny you mentioned uh, pre-ownership underwater as well, which is another segment, which I'm sure we can detail. But, you know, one aspect of uh, of that is that whenever people come on, they can sort of talk about um, their situations and whatever opportunity they've found. And we can kind of review that with them and just give some honest advice about what we think they should do based on what their mission and values and aspirations are. And a lot of times that does end up being an acquisition. So we're kind of walking through um, sort of in vivo acquisitions on the show a lot. Um, but we also bring on experts every now and then, people involved in the transition team, um, dentists who have had success, dentists who haven't had success. And a lot of times that does have to do with acquisitions. Um, on occasion, we do talk startups, we do talk partnerships every now and then. Um, and we just talk about every facet that we think is relevant to that sort of pre-ownership journey that's really at the core of shared practices. And and now it's just a part of what we do, but it's still something we really value. And we understand that we have a, a young audience and there's always going to be some room for that. And I will say this is where um, we started to hit our stride was this type of content that you guys are now doing every Wednesday, which is, and the stuff that wasn't out there was how do I actually do these steps and figure out which practice to buy? Because that just didn't exist in the podcasting space or in the online space well at all. And a lot of our listeners used season two to find and buy a dental practice and have done very well with that. And I'll, I'll edit the TPO comments as well and say that, you know, we had to come in and uh, correct things because as we became owners, mm -hmm. we had a different perspective on pre-ownership. And mm -hmm. so we like to consider TPO our, you know, the pursuit of ownership, that ongoing segment, our right. ability to look at pre-ownership differently now that we're owners and we can see it from both sides. I think it's added a great perspective. You know, if you think of the 300 hours of content, I would roughly guess 200 hours of that are either related to is practice ownership right for me, acquisitions, or startups. I think the whole pre-ownership segment is roughly, I, I don't know exactly, but I'd say roughly 200 hours. Yeah. yeah. And I think another key aspect of that is that, you know, we are teaching this in a, in a sense, but we're also experiencing it. And as we go along, you know, we're repeating things through iteration and we're improving along the along the bl blueprint of the advice that we give. Um, but it's always, it, it's, it's open to change as things happen in our lives and our careers and as we learn more and as we interact with, uh, you know, our audience and get more stories of their own ownership journey. So it's really important that we kind of keep that segment alive and keep things rolling and, and uh, kind of letting people know what we learn as we go along. Perfect. Um, so can we move on to season three here? Se season three will be quick. Go for we it. We can skip it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can skip season three. I'm kidding. Yeah. So the reason that joke is being made is because it's on startups, which you'll learn on the show. We try to be transparent and authentic. And so you will hear about the things we love emphatically, and you'll hear about the things we don't love emphatically. So season three is startups. And that's one of the things I don't love. And and I and And I asked George, a year into uh, us working together, I was like, I need to step back even further and do even less with the show. I have to finish this residency. It's killing me. And so George ran with this season that he emphatically was not passionate about. Um, and so there, I would say sometimes we lose people in season three. So if you're either not into startups or uh, you are into startups and we're asking for more, we're sorry. Um, yeah, I, and I skipped over this as a listener. I, I stopped listening to season three, took a pause. Yeah. So give yourself permission to just skip season three. I will say that um, 
startups versus acquisition, and that's a topic we run up to yeah. a lot. Our feelings have if, changed. Our feelings have changed. Um, we are more warm on on startups and their potential. And um, done right, you can get very quickly up to speed with a startup and you end up owing sometimes half. You know, if you can build a million dollar practice and you you start that up and you can get there in, in the first 12 months, you then owe $500,000 versus buying, you know, a million dollar practice and owing a million dollars. Um, and there's some advantages to that, but you have to do everything right. Yes. Um, and that's the hardest thing is people go into ownership with the most challenging aspect is doing a startup from scratch. And so you have the least tools to do the hardest thing and people tend to screw it up um, or, or DIY and, and cheap out on certain things and, and not, not know how to balance all of the priorities because you have to you have to do everything from scratch. And, you know, the thing I'll add on that is, again, you know, startups, if you're going to do one, do it in a way that'll pay off for you and makes it worth that initial runway of taking longer to get an ownership and all the things that come with that. And so I think we're we're starting to see that perspective as well. And again, you know, we've changed a lot. And this is one of the things that I'm actually not as against as I was, you know, three and a half years ago when I started. And I think it's also important to talk about, you know, kind of what is our box and the sort of things that we really like to talk about and the things that we are emphatically passionate about. And there's a lot of other things that we don't really put a whole lot of emphasis on. Um, you know, there's niche type practices, there's a lot of specialty out there, people doing different things, there's startups, but what we kind of, you know, sort of uh, gravitate towards is uh, models of practice and ways about getting into practice that we feel are profitable, simple and sustainable. Right. So that's that's something we're really big on. And we're not trying to teach you how to do this like really weird, crazy, uh, you know, uh, eccentric practice. This is how dentistry, we feel, should be done in a way that's very befitting uh, to owners and uh, really extracts all the potential that comes out of um, even your everyday practice. And that's that kind of reconnects to the redefining average concept. Right. We're, we're trying to improve what is the average practice. And so we don't spend quite as much time on things that we consider to be somewhat eccentric or uncommon. Awesome. Well, so let's move on to season four and five then. And I, I can kind of summarize those both at once. Um, we wanted to now provide people who are in practice ownership with skills and tools um, to become successful practice owners. And we started at a place that I felt like hadn't been covered in depth in any uh, dental podcast, which was uh, case acceptance. So how do I present 10 grand of treatment without offending a patient um, and helping them make the decision to take care of their own health. How do I increase that uh, percentage? How do I make it from easier for my team to do that? Um, and as a whole, as an office to focus on case acceptance in a way that leads to great outcomes. And we're not talking about overdiagnosing. We're not talking about anything else. This is diagnosing accurately the work that needs to be done and helping patients get across the line and get that work done. So we did a whole season on that. And that's a topic that people are going to have to work on their entire careers. Um, and I have a ton of room to grow in there. I, I think we've all found things that work for us. Um, and, and, and Matt's, you know, passionate about this and has uh, future content coming around this uh, as, as well. So felt like uh, case acceptance is a great place to start because if someone lacks case acceptance, so someone becomes a practice owner and they can't present treatment well, that is definitely going to be an impediment to them growing a practice. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, the, the quickest way to kind of grow on the doctor side of a dental office is through case acceptance. It's not through adding procedures or, you know, mm -hmm. getting complicated. It, it, it's talking to people, it's connecting to humans. It's, you know, ethically persuading them to go forward with treatment that is needed. will make the biggest difference in pretty much any dental office around the country. And it's a, it's a super a sustainable skill that can really pay dividends for you, you know, years and years into your career. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a head game. Like if you come to the table with like a bunch of stuff around money, around um, what people can afford and what's, you know, there's a lot internal to this and not only for yourself, but also for your teammates. Uh, so your team members. So, you know, your, your assistant, your hygienist, if they think this is really expensive treatment and they're afraid to present it to patients, then they're not going to do it well. And so there's a lot of coaching and work to be done in that space. Um, and, and a lot of it kind of feels ooey gooey, but it, it matters. It matters quite a bit. Anything to add, George, before we move on to season uh, five now? No, I just want to reiterate what Matt said, right? Tyler talked about PSS, right? Profitable, simple, sustainable. Watch that in action. The most effective, simple way to grow your practice is by talking to people effectively. That's simple. 
that's sustainable, and mm-hmm. that's the most profitable single thing that can be done to grow a practice from one month to the next. And so, you know, that's watching our philosophy in action. And awesome. and if I may, that I, I would say that's probably the most doctor side thing that we do in terms oh, yeah. of like telling people how to be a dentist. You know, we, we don't really talk about how you treat patients or how you diagnose necessarily. This is more about whatever it is that you think you need to do as a dentist, we are helping you, uh, you know, actually get that on the other end and actually affect your bottom line and actually do the dentistry and, and have patients accepting treatment. And we never really go so far into, you know, how to be a dentist. We, I think we always kind of meet people halfway with whatever type of dentist they, they really are clinically speaking. Absolutely. And we made that conscious choice. Like we, we are not a clinical podcast right. and we will never be a clinical podcast and we're okay with that. And we hope you're okay with that. Um, so the next season was um, another ooey gooey season. And, and this is where I t- like to take these deep dives on. Let's, let's go into a topic that's difficult to explore. It's difficult to extract results out of, but really matters. And that's leadership, culture, and change. So how do you, how do you diagnose yourself as a leader? Am I a bad leader? Where can I improve? Um, how can I get feedback from my team in a sustainable way and doing a 360 with my team? How can I become better at handling conflict, about holding people accountable. Um, These are the kind of things that if you can't handle conflict, you can't hold people accountable, your practice will suffer. There will will be conversations that you avoid that hold you and your practice back uh, because you are afraid to step up to the plate. And creating a culture in your office where team members are able to handle conflict among themselves, they're able to bring things up, bring up ideas, bring up problems without fear of uh, losing their job of retribution from the team. That's hard to do. You know, we're, we're, we're humans. We get offended. We read into things. We come with assumptions and all of that, uh, can be untangled and worked on so that not only are you a better leader, your teammates, uh, your team members are, are better at having these difficult conversations on creating a culture, living up to this vision that you've created for practice. Um, but it's something that if you don't focus on it, it will not happen. Um, and, and is another area where uh, we feel we have a lot to offer in terms of working directly with doctors on their leadership, on on their ability to have these difficult conversations. Um, and it's a lot of fun because I I had my dad on who uh, has done crucial conversations, has trained Fortune 500 companies on all this kind of stuff on on leadership work. And uh, across the board, everyone was like, you know what, your dad's actually a whole lot better at all of this than you are. And I'm like, thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs> I can attest to uh, to Murray. He has uh, coached me as well. And, you know, great time with him. And, you know, I think that, again, like the soft skills, right, your ability to communicate with patients, and then your ability to communicate with your team. We think maybe patience is very tangible, and you can see the benefit of that. But we hope to show you the benefit of growing your leadership and how much that can transform your life and your practice. And that's season five. Awesome. Well, and before we get to season six, let's introduce uh, practice underwater um, and, and how that evolved. So this, this came from uh, a conversation I had with Jamie Amos at uh, some event. I can't remember which one. And he was like, man, I have all these people who come to me all the time who are like, I need help with my practice. Like I am struggling and, and he's like, I don't have anywhere to send them. And, and that triggered some conversations between George and I of like, man, it'd be really cool if we had a podcast where we could basically x-ray a practice and then create an anonymous coaching session where we change their name, change their voice and, and look at these practices. And, and George and Matt, you two took this idea and ran with it and created what's now our, our most popular and I think our most impactful segment of, of the podcast. So, so talk to us about that. So when Matt and I were designing shared practices coaching, we had two tenants that we wanted to stand by. So Matt, life coaching program, really big on mindset of the owner. And so we had mindset and then we had metrics. And you know, I brought analytics and you know, you wonder how, you know, I, I said it earlier, I have a GP office. We do literally nothing crazy. It's the most regular dental office. And a new grad took that and more than doubled it in two years. It's this concept called analytics-based practice management of using metrics to run an office and pulling the right levers at the right times. And so we married these two concepts and we have our philosophy now, the shared practices philosophy that we've sort of ironed out on practice underwater. And so we get this guest on and we change their name. We, we, we don't say their location. We change their voice, but we show all of their numbers. And so you can download this dentist's numbers to see their production, their collections, their accounts receivable, all of their different key performance indicators. 
and we can you can digest these practices with us to see the paths to growth. And over time, we've really been able to refine our philosophy in Practice Underwater. You can watch our transformation of refining our own philosophy through, you know, it's we've been doing it now for 16 months, Practice Underwater. And, you know, it's a lot of episodes and a lot of practices that we've looked at. And you can hear the change in our philosophy over the last 16 months on air. And, and the key to it all is the anonymity of it, that they can come on. No one knows who they are. They share their numbers. They don't give any of their details. They're able to be their most vulnerable self about what's really going on in their practice. And it, it's cool, uh, George and I, as the kind of unbiased observer, we're able to point out a lot of the ways that they're getting in their own way and don't even know it. Um, so our first part of the episode, they're usually two-part episodes with the guests. First part is really big on mindset, on discovering where they are, like, hindering themselves. And, and the second part being more of that analytics base. Okay, now we kind of have worked through some of those issues. Let's make an action plan based on what your numbers say is what are the next uh, you know, tangible moves you're able to make your, to move the practice forward. You know, and the thing that we've, we've learned throughout all of these guests is you look at a practice and we call it practice underwater and you think they're all going bankrupt. It's actually the opposite. These are people who listen to our show. We're redefining average. We're getting these great offices, but when you listen to them and they change their voice and we change their name and they're able to get vulnerable, you'll see that somebody who you might look at and say, man, their practice is doing 2 million a year. They've got it all together. You'll find out like our guest Ace doesn't have an office manager and the staff's a total, you know, there's not a whole lot going on that's organized. And so you'll see under the, and they are underwater, even though financially they may not be, there's a lot of other issues that we under, we uncover. So the name actually kind of held up, even though we didn't get the type of guests we were expecting. We were hoping to get those bankrupt practices. We only had a, two or three of those. But you know, the other ones are, are financially successful, but still need a lot of help. The, the other thing I'll say is that I, I feel like this segment is where um, we refined not only uh, our philosophy on, on metrics and mindset, but also I thought coming into shared practices, um, this almost had a few other names. I can't even remember them. One of them was like the Systems Academy. Like I wanted to figure out what are the best systems. Yeah. Like you figure out the best way to do your schedule, the best way to do your calls and your recall and your supply. And if you just plug in all the right systems, your practice is going to be successful. Um, and and I f feel like that's actually what a lot of dentists feel like is like, oh, I just need a better system. Um, and, and then everything would be good. And there are people out there who that's what they teach. Here's a book full of systems and that's going to solve your problems. Um, when in fact, it's it's not the what or it's not the how to do these things. It's the what things to do. So talk to us about that, George. So we have this concept called the who, what, how hierarchy. And we want to start with the bottom, which is who. That's you, the owner. And we, we really begin, our philosophy begins with the mindset of the dentist who owns a practice or the mindset of the pre-owner. You know, are you thinking clearly? Do you have the right mindset for growth? Then if that's all in place, then we look at your analytics. What? You know, that's why we start part one of practice underwater with vision, with the owner. We check out their, how their mindset is. And then part two is, you know, those metrics on what to do to get your practice to where you want to go now that we've ironed out the ownership mindset and their goals and all that. And that's what, and then that last step is what everyone else always talks about, how to do it. So we still believe in the systems and doing things the way that everyone else talks about, but it doesn't matter how you do something if you're not doing the right thing. And so what to do, you need to know that before you know how to do it. And you need to know, you need to have the right mindset so you can see clearly what to do. So it starts with who, then what, then how. And, and a wrinkle onto that, like what to do, but what to do when, yeah. like what is the logical sequence of events that's going to push your practice, you know, in the right direction and, and how to diagnose that through our analytics is, is something that really cool that we offer on this part of our show. I, I think the, the place where this becomes the most obvious is where someone has bought a great practice and they're now a, an owner and they're in their first three months of ownership. And there's this sense of like, oh crap there's a lot of things wrong with this practice and there's a lot of things I could do. And there's a lot of systems in this practice that are like decent, but not great. And so there's this, where do I start? What is, what is the bottleneck? And, and that's the concept that um, the metrics based really reveals is, is what is the thing that is holding your practice back? And that if you work on that thing, you're going to get results. And then there's going to be another bottleneck. And then there's going to be another bottleneck but you can end up getting lost chasing all of these accessory systems and never addressing the bottleneck and not seeing growth. And, and 
having perspective, having someone else look at your practice, look at your metrics, that's where you can figure that out. Because when you're in it, it's really hard to see what the bottleneck. And I thought you were going to say something else, but for me, practice underwater is where we made the transition from we were guys exploring ideas to we were a company that had a way of doing things that we believe in is better than anything else. And now we're talking about it. And I feel like there's an inflection point somewhere in our podcast from exploration to discovery. And that happened at somewhere along Practice Underwater's trajectory or arc. And you know, now we have a director of coaching, Suzanne Rassi, who was an industry person and came on our side, believes in our philosophy, and is executing it with our whole coaching team of former office managers. And so it it really practice underwater is where that progression started from, you know, exploration to discovery to innovative company. And I really think that all happened on air. And if someone's listening to this and they're like, man, I, I kind of want that. Um, there's a way that you can go on our website and sign up for a discovery call, get on the wait list uh, to have your practice looked at. Um, and it's a really cool way for us to interact with our audience in a way that uh, is very intimate and, and you have to be uh, ready for, for feedback, whether or not you, you know, you're looking for feedback in all of these areas. There might be areas that you don't realize, oh crap, I had a blind spot here. I'm not very good at this. Um, is there ever pushback from people that are like not ready to hear what you guys have to tell them? All the time. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got people for the first half hour, they try to defend themselves. They're like, yeah, it's because of blank and, you know, Mr. Excuses or we call Mr. Right Answer some, you know, but yeah, we will get through that quick. We, you know, we're trained Matt and I on, on getting through that. We get through the crap and we get to the source. <laughs> nice. So, well, um, so now, I kind of wanted to wrap up with if we all sort of, you know, I think one thing that if you've never listened to our podcast before, and this is your first time listening to us, you might not fully understand the impact that we've had on our audience's lives. And I don't think we can communicate that on air, but I I think it'd be great if we at some point touched on the impact shared practice had on our own lives personally, because, you know, to, there's a reason we talk the way we do and believe in what we do to the level that we do. And it's because of the impact it's had on our own lives. And we're just sharing our experiences. So if you, anyone wants to start, I think it'd be great if we went around and talked about that. Let's see, Tyler, we're going to volunteer. You got it. I think Tyler um, has the one that's uh, the most in the works and kind of uh, nebulous, um, being that I'm, of course, still in school and we're uh, trying to figure out exactly uh, what happens after school. But just to kind of catch people up, I mean, I, you know, when I found Share Praxis, I was, uh, I was working in a, in, a, in a dental lab. I was a digital lab technician um, and I was just uh, trying to get into school. And I didn't know exactly what I was doing with my life, to be perfectly honest. I kind of uh, got hamstrung or shoehorned into uh, being a dentist. I wasn't entirely sure what it was all about. And um, I just I, I was having a hard time really visualizing myself in that role as a dentist. And I was, you know, just sort of looking for answers and looking for role models. And uh, I was really fortunate to find that um, in the Share Practices podcast. And, you know, I, uh, George and, and, and Richard both were idols for me um, for a time. And now they're in the they eventually became role models. And now they're very close friends of mine. Um, and I think that's, you know, personally a huge uh, impact that they've had. Um, but professionally speaking, I mean, I, there is absolutely no way, um, you know, looking ahead at, at my next, you know, year or five years, possibly 10 years, um, that something of that nature could have been manifested on my own. And I, I think that that's really uh, what's so powerful about this is that we synergistically create futures for ourselves that would have never been possible um, were we just trying to do it in, in isolation in a vacuum. And I think that's what we offer to all of our audiences, you know, to come on board and, and see what's really possible. And um, that's oftentimes not at all what they expected. Awesome. Well, Matt, let's, let's have you go. Follow that, yeah. Matt. <laughs> it's funny oh, when you ask that question, George. I, I I went back to a conversation I had years ago when I was a D1. I haven't thought about this in like forever. Uh, my friend group and I were talking like who's going to make the most money out of our friend group kind of in their careers. And and my name got brought up like, yo, you're a dentist. Like you're going to make a lot of money. And I immediately was, was like, no, I'm going to have like a ton of debt. Like you have no idea. Like I'm not getting out of this. And that was 2016, 2017. I started listening to the Share Practice podcast and found the route to get out of it. And, and, you know, fast forwarding, we're in the Macarino money realm and all that stuff. But um, <laughs> it, it just provided so much knowledge and opportunity and possibility in my own dental career that, you know, I couldn't have fathomed back before I listened. And then, you know, now um, I'm down from a solo practicing dentist to one and a half days a week because I'm more full time COO of Share Practices. And 
I, I consider myself entrepreneur first, dentist second. And that is something that has been uh, the biggest gift in my own life. Um, so I really owe everything to the podcast and this company. Well, uh, thanks, man. Um, so I'll, I'll go and I'll let you wrap up, George. Um, I, I really wanted this to be helpful like the whole time. Like that's been one of my things was I want to be able to help other dentists via this podcast. Um, and ironically, I've benefited just as much, if not more. I would never have been able to buy three dental practices in the army uh, if it weren't for shared practices, for the knowledge, the connections. And even though I'm actually leaving those practices, and we just had an episode about that recently, um, it's been an incredible experience. I've learned a ton. I've worked with amazing people, amazing partners. Um, and none of that would have been possible with, without shared practices. I also am I'm trying to close on another transaction before I get out of the army. I can't really talk about that yet. But uh, all of these things, there's there's a concept in a book uh, called So Good They Can't Ignore You. Um, I can't remember the author's name right now. But he talks about the adjacent possible and how really in life we end up making a series of decisions around adjacent possible. So you, you kind of reach the, the epitome of what you could be doing in your current situation. And then something will come up next that you didn't really think was possible. And you move into that next space. And then you move into that next space. And those adjacent possible opportunities, if you keep maximizing each one of those, you'll end up in a place that you never thought possible in the first place. And that very much is, is where I, I feel like I currently am. Um, and, and part of that too is I remember hearing there was a group of, a mastermind group in dentistry with uh, David Maloli, um, Graham Dursley, some other people. And I remember thinking like, man, it sounds like I kind of missed the boat on that mastermind because it was like a certain generation of dentists that all were entrepreneurial focused, um, great people, a lot of fun to be around. I was like, I want to create that. I want to have that for our generation of dentists. And shared practices has very much become that literally in, in terms of our mastermind and the people we have in our mastermind. And then in terms of our team, our, the, the, George, Matt, Tyler, everyone else that's involved in, in shared practices are some of our closest friends and relationships. And then we get to share that with uh, other dentists in our mastermind, in our coaching. And um, that's been so rewarding and, and honestly is, is way more um, satisfying than I ever thought was, was possible. So, um, and, and also the fact that uh, George and Matt and, and everyone has built this while I'm still in the army. I, I, my, in my acquisitions, uh, my three acquisitions and in shared practices, I really can't take that much credit. It's like, if you build it, they will come, identified the practices, partners did all the hard work, built the idea of shared practices, and then you all have done all the hard work um, while I've wrapped up my army commitment. So I am so grateful that you guys are part of our team and, and part of my life. And, and it's been a blast. So George, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks. You know, it's I mean, to say that shared practices changed my life would be about the biggest understatement I could ever say. You know, I came on as a third year dental student, super confused, just wanted to be a solo dentist. And I think that when you have that community and those people around you, the flow of ideas is so much faster. And what you talked about, like adjacent possibility, looking at someone else do something then made me feel like, oh, I can do that thing. And now we've done things that very few have. And we can get back on air and to our audience, we can talk about like, hey, look at what we did, you know, and the whole lesson is we're all sharing the things that we were able to do. And the fact that we were able to accomplish them as a collective community have accomplished a lot of really rare things. Now they seem ordinary to the rest of us so that we can all follow suit. And it's this constant act of, you know, us elevating, you know, each other. And on a personal note, you know, representing this company as our CEO, you know, I, I view myself as the tip of the iceberg and I, it's the biggest honor and the biggest burden, not because of the role itself. It's because of the people that, you know, we represent. It's our team are some of the most impressive people I know. And to be the leader of that team of, you know, the talent we have on our roster at every position, there is nothing like it. And I don't think there ever will be. So, you know, it, it couldn't be a greater honor. Uh, to be in this role. Well, well, this has been this has been amazing, and uh, hopefully, if you're not, you know, hadn't heard of shared practices before now, uh, or maybe heard of us and kind of wrote us off as like oh, a couple of young dentists doing something weird. Um, hopefully, you can see that there there's some amazing things that have happened out of shared practices, which used to be a podcast trying to be a company, is now very much a company that happens to have a podcast. 
Um, if you're interested in becoming more part of our community, join our Facebook group, uh, Shared Practices, listen to the podcast. Um, hopefully you can figure out where to put yourself in terms of the seasons at this point. And, um, and if you're looking for help, reach out. Like we are here, we've got support, we've got mastermind, we've got coaching. Um, we have the ability to help you customize what you need to do uh, to, to move to the next level and, and figure out what those bottlenecks are and move forward. So uh, any last words here before we wrap it up? No, I think that was great. That was great. And, and if you want more info on any of our offerings, sharepractice.com, you can explore them all. They're all there. And this is a lot of fun. Yeah, this was great. Awesome. Well, we will talk to you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in on the Shared Practices Podcast.